Okay, in theory, we're recording. I can't actually see the little dot. Can you, Dee? Yes, I can. It's recording. All right, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, Dee will help keep track of people who are trying to come in late. I appreciate that a lot. Um, today, we're doing our second of three walks in the Clayhead Trail system. And last week, we did the middle section west part. And this, uh, today we're gonna do the middle section east part. Um, and uh, last week we started from the entry that goes in at Long Lot Pond. And this week we're gonna start the entry that goes in uh, from the Clayhead Trail parking lot. Uh, one of the things about today's walk is that we're gonna try to hit most of the ponds in the Clayhead Trail. So. I'll give you an overview right now of where we're going. And uh, as I said yesterday, do not use this map for wayfinding. The white lines, I've outlined um, the Clayhead Trail uh, uh, preserved area, but there I did it over the Google map, so I couldn't see the fi some fine details and I may have missed a jog here or there or a, a line may not be quite right and you'll see down by clayhead swamp uh, pond the line is dotted because i'm not exactly sure how it goes there so anyway you get the gist a good chunk of uh, the northeast corner of black island is part of the clayhead trail preserve and the area we're going to be doing is this area right here and um this is the uh, map a little closer. There we go. I'm gonna... um, so I'm going to give quite a bit of an overview right here before we start with the fancy pictures. Um, you're going to come in the Clayhead Trail Road, which is right across from the transfer station off of Corneck Road, and you'll come in and you'll park in the parking area. Um, where you usually uh, pick up the trailhead that goes uh, sort of along the southern edge out to the bluff and then goes along the bluff edge. That's the primary cliff trail area. But you can park there and then walk, retrace your steps and walk back and then turn, take a right. You're going to hear me saying take a right a lot. And then take a right on the dirt road. There's a little sign right here that says Lapham. So this is the Lapham driveway. But right here at spot number one, is where we'll be entering and there's a it's well signed uh, as an entry point and we're going to take what used to be called the blue path or the blue trail and i've indicated a light blue line along this so some parts of this is going to be corresponding to the old blue trail it's still marked and you'll, you'll see that as we go along and we're going to go out and at some point the blue trail its whole point is to meet the cliff trail which it does goes here, but we'll leave it and then go our own sort of version of that. And we'll stop in at the ponds here and there, the ponds here, make our way around here, and back here, hit another pond and associated wetlands, and then come back this way. There are some, this is a much more complicated, just waiting for the plane. It's Monday morning on Block Island summer and all these people are trying to get off island and get back to their workaday lives <laughs> on the nine o'clock flight. <laughs> okay, so we've heard three of them. There can't be that many more flights going off at nine. Anyway, I digress as usual. Um, you'll notice uh, it's a more complicated map than usual. This, the yellow, the main big yellow line is our trail. The blue indicates the blue trail, which is marked and this very lighter, much lighter yellow is the long lot uh, trail to the bluff. So I put that in there so that you can see at some points we'll be going along it like here, and but other parts we will be diverging. So this would be the regular trail from long lot to the bluff. And for the most part, we're not taking that today. All right, so I think that'll get us started fairly well. And so here we are at our starting point. Um, it's well marked, as I said, trail to the cliff with a blue piece of flagging tape right here. 
and uh, and you'll walk right in here and there's a sign that says walkers welcome and again clayhead trail system on the and the acquisition of clayhead property is and and the fact that it's in conservation is all due to the lapham family starting way back in the 1960s and 70s so thank you to them so if you go around the corner here you will see that this um branch is right there i have to i, I i'm seeing a person so i'm moving the person out <laughs> there we go um this is the branch that's sort of falling down it's for years it's been leaning down and leaning down and now it's actually its elbow is touching so it makes a nice little uh marker so you'll come in and you'll go right and follow the edge of the path and um until you get and you'll come to this little boardwalk this is uh, one of three uh boardwalks that we'll be crossing today so there's little bits of moisture not this time of year but in the spring you'll be happy that the boardwalks are there um and you'll we went over this last year uh last week um but so we'll retracing a, a few of our steps not too many oops nice didn't want to do that just yet uh go over this and you'll be following the trail to the east uh and it is the blue trail and you'll see these little blue markers uh, uh flagging here and there um just to reassure you you're on the right tra track and um i always say don't worry if you get lost in the in the uh clayhead trails you, you'll find your way out it's an island after all so on you go um, along the way right now uh, this week we're seeing bull thistle and uh, it's quite a beautiful thistle although it is a little prickly and uh, so you want to be careful um, not to just to admire it from afar it's not really a good thistle to uh, pick you notice those very sharp spines and they're stiff so they'll get you so we have blue um, blue thistle there and uh, and as you keep going along you'll come to the place where there's this large pine which is uh, a, a good field mark for the clayhead trail so it's the big pine and uh, it's a good place to say head for the big, big pine especially in the winter time when the leaves are off you can see this from a number of places around clayhead and we'll be going around it to the left and up the hill and you'll come up the hill and you'll see what i'm calling the uh the uh the blue trail rotary all right so you'll come up the here and we're going to be going this way to the right this that's the blue trail but there is another path that goes off this way so you can do it so make sure you notice that it, the uh, it's a little cherry the uh the rotary tree will help keep you going on the right direction and you'll be going up a hill and you'll get to the top of the hill um and this is this is a panoramic view so it's a little distorted but it actually gives a pretty good sense of what it's like it's a big open area at the top of the hill um we'll be continuing on this way uh, but it's all open here we will have come from this direction and we'll go this way but you notice there's a there, it's hard to see it's it's midsummer there is a little path in here and there's a bench and when i first started wandering these fields back in around 1980 is when i really started doing it a bit this this whole stone wall was all exposed and this bench was quite a bit out from it um, but now uh, it's shady um, and from this knob, this little hilltop, you could see in the past, you could see both harbors, the new harbor and the old harbor. Uh, but the vegetation has grown up so high that unless you're about twice as tall as I am, you're not going to be able to see that view anymore. So, but that, tr that little chair bench is right there. And, um, and then if you wanted to, you could go that way, but that's not what we're doing today and uh, if you keep going the trail then goes downhill for a bit and you come to another wet spot and then there here's our second boardwalk um and you'll find lots of wetland plants and uh you if you've been following me this summer you know i've been talking a lot about ferns and how hard they are to tell apart 
I have uh, placed two here. One of them is quite a bit bigger than the other. So this one here, and then these two small ones. And the way that you tell them apart, or not the way, I know that these are two different species, um, but exactly which species they are, I do not know. I believe this is cinnamon fern, but I could be wrong. I'm still working on it, and I believe this is New York fern. Again, I'm still learning, so that's why I wouldn't write anything on the actual PowerPoint presentation. But how you tell is uh, sometimes is look at the spore pattern. So this uh, branch right here is this branch. And it's also this branch when I turned it over. And this is actually not a branch, but a leaf. And if you look closely, and I think I can do that for you, um, you'll see on the underside of these little uh, petioles, these little leaves, leaflets, are lots of little spore packets um, for, and that's how this uh, ferns reproduce by spores, uh, like mosses, not like the regular uh, vascular plants that most of flowering uh, plants are. So it's very interesting. I've just started learning this myself this summer and lo and behold, I turned this one over and it actually had spores on it. This so of course it made me instantly wish that I had my loop with me because I couldn't really see them that clearly until I got it home. But I got a good photo and I could blow it up. So yay for modern technology and modern camera. So that's uh, one set. And then there's, uh, these are two very large uh, ferns. This is the one that was the same species, not the same individual plant that was on the boardwalk that I just showed you. And uh, that, so I believe that's the cinnamon fern. And then there was this other very large one in a different spot. And I took the photo. And if you look closely again, you'll see that at first they look like the same large fern. But when you look at the patterns of the leaf, you'll see that they're very different. Um, these little petioles, they sort of had these big you know, round, you know, little fat teeth, whereas these have very narrow teeth and the teeth have teeth. Um, so it's clearly a different species, but to the average walker, which was me two weeks ago, uh, this would have been the same fern. So there's lots to learn and, uh, whoops, a little too far there. Uh, lots to learn and um, I'm still learning. I guess we all will be and maybe by next year I'll be an expert on the ferns of Clayhead at least. Who knows? But we're going on and one thing I noticed on this particular walk that suddenly things are ripening and changing and instead of seeing the new buds of a lot of flowers and plants and um, bright green leaves, we're seeing, you know, the pitted, darker, eaten, scaled uh, leaves of late summer. Um, lots of things cause the leaves to, to degenerate. Um, things eat them, they get rusts or molds on them, uh, they get torn off by, um, they just get old and a little bit more raggedy. They're still doing their job though. And the berries are changing. So early on, uh, we saw viburnum or arrowwood, which was that beautiful white panicle flower. And then uh, one of our walks, we saw that the berries were uh, green and now they're getting their characteristic ripened dark blue color. And uh, most of the bushes, uh, arrowwood bushes that uh, I saw in the clayhead were still green, but there was one area where they were all ripe. And I don't know if they're just particularly protected or just a you know genetic variation. That's what makes the world go around is finding genetic variation. And maybe there's a reason that ripening a little earlier <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is good. <clears throat> Coffee time. <clears throat> and uh, bayberries, uh, as you have may have heard me say before, bayberries do not start off that beautiful blue-gray waxy color. They start off a bright chartreuse green, and now they're changing. That was a month ago, they were green and now they're sort of gray green and you're starting to see 
a little bit where they're starting to get a little wax covering, but they're not covered in wax just yet. And again, there is, um, time is progressing this summer. So the berries are starting to ripen and become more evident. And then of course, you have to come to a fork in the road, uh, the fork in the path of which there are many at uh, Clayhead. Uh, in this particular case, you can take either one. They will land you in roughly the same spot. Uh, we're going to, sort of the theme, and you'll hear me say this a lot more, is stay right, keep going right. And uh, so we're gonna take the right fork, and that will take us out to this intersection. Uh, and if you remember, I, I indicated there was a place where the blue trail, here's a little blue tag, the blue trail keeps going to the bluffs from left to right in this vision. And we're actually going to go off in a different, uh, we're going to parallel the, uh, the cliff trail for a little while. So this is the, the great crossroads of the, uh, the blue trail going into the Clayhead Trails. Um, and it's, again, this sign, we've been converting, we, we the Conservancy and the Lapham family, have been converting the signs so uh, some of the old ones were like this. This actually says to Corneck, and this little sign is supposed to be down the path near the cliff sign, but it somehow walked its way up here. I don't know how that happened, but this one is the new style um, the Lapham family has been putting in, and it also says to Corneck with the arrow. So if you stay on the blue trail, uh, just to get to the bluff trail, cliff trail and back, you'll never get lost. Just just follow the signs. All right. And uh, I should have mentioned that there may be some surprises in some of these images. So maybe you should look close every once in a while. You never know what you might see. Onward. If we turn around right at that spot, there's a big choke cherry tree that is. Uh, it also is as ripening fruit, and most of the choke cherry not yet this ripe. But this is a; uh, these are little uh, choke cherries, and they have a, a stone pit, a pit, you know, like a cherry in them, but they're tiny. Birds love these, which is probably how the choke cherries got spread all over the island. And you can see these leaves are quite marked. The uh, the tent caterpillars love these in the spring. And uh, in the summer, these little guys are liking them, saddleback caterpillars. And uh, at first I didn't notice them, but I had been alerted to them, which is a good thing because these babies, their hairs sting. You do not want to touch them. But um, choke cherries are very high in vitamin C and birds love them and people do uh, collect them and, and make choke cherry uh, jelly out of them. Uh, you have to make a jelly, not a jam, because the pit is too much of a percentage of the, of the fruit itself. So, but um, if it's a good choke cherry year, I have a friend I know who will be making choke cherry jelly. Um, just to take another look at this caterpillar, blow it up a little bit. Uh, it's really quite a beautiful little caterpillar. It's tiny. Uh, it's less than an inch in this view, each one of these. And there are several here. One, two, three. There's at least another one over here. They've got these wonderful prongs. But these hairs are stinging. They will actually hurt, significantly hurt. And uh, stay with you for many hours. Um, fortunately, I did not brush up against them. Uh, but a friend did the experiment for me. So, <laughs> but they're pretty cool looking. I'd never seen them before. They're so beautiful and so tiny. Unless you look, you just think that they were a bronze spot on the uh, on the leaf. And uh, this is the cater uh, is the moth. So the saddleback moth caterpillar produces this uh, very brown. Uh, very shimmery. It looked almost looks like a fur coat to me. Uh, you know, I don't think a mink has anything over this beautiful uh, saddleback moth. So. And thanks to uh, Nigel Grinley for his <clears throat> photo. One thing I will digress just a minute and point out the antenna on the moth are fuzzy. Let's see if I can blow up that. That's 
the background of it is makes it a little difficult. But the way you tell a moth from a butterfly is that the antennae on the moth are always furry and fuzzy, um, whereas on the butterfly they're just wands. They're not fuzzy at all. On we go. So if we're going along uh, the path that parallels the cliff, and if you had taken the left way back when I said there's a fork in the road or a fork in the path, you would come out here. So it's really pretty much the same spot. And we're about to leave the densely wooded part of this walk so far and go out into this big field where there are these wonderful um, uh, native, not native, but uh, some are native, some are not, but wildflowers. It's an open field, which a lot of the clayhead trails you feel very confined under the shrubs. <clears throat> but here we're going out into the open and uh, but the, although there was that little stand of uh, black-eyed Susans, beautiful, most of the black-eyed Susans today, or the day I took this walk, were in this form, uh, already um, bloomed, blossomed, and um, setting up their seed heads to distribute seeds, which are all right in here, just like, just like a little sunflower of course it is in the same family so beautiful on we go <clears throat> so now we're going to start visiting some of the ponds on this walk and uh just probably 50 feet from that view i just showed you um, and i'm going to review the map at the end a little bit too but you'll see this is what's called stump pond doesn't look like much of a pond the uh, water level right now is very low all around the island, and um, it looks pretty muddy. I found this interesting. Usually when I'm looking in this pond, it's, it's all water. Uh, this is a high spot. This is a, a little high spot of mud. I didn't walk out there because I wouldn't have my shoes left, but um, it's a very muddy little <clears throat> water lily pond. And, so this whole mat is what this is. It's just solid with water lily leaves and water lilies. And there, if you stand there just for a moment, you'll see that the flowers are just totally abuzz with um, different uh, bees and dragonflies and just focusing just for a moment. All of a sudden you see this ton of activity going on over the top you know, six inches above the whole mat of uh, water lily uh, pads. Uh, I will say one of the, my attractions to the ponds is one, they're, they're a break in the landscape. Two, they usually have really interesting flowers and plants associated with them. And three, water is a great place to look for birds when you're bird watching. So this loop would be a great bird watchers uh, loop because you're going to hit many different types of uh, wetland uh, areas. So we'll go on. So this is another wide view, but <clears throat> the pond we visited was right behind this shrub. Then we came out, went around the edge of this field. This is the field we were looking at when I indicated that we were going into big open field. And then we're coming down this edge, which has a, several oaks along it. And then we'll come out and we're meeting the cliff trail here. So this is the main cliff trail. You can't go any further east without going in the ocean than this trail. So we're gonna go along this way. Um, and along the way, we see a few more um, fall flowers. What's interesting about this is the goldenrod is just beginning. We're just starting to see a few different species of goldenrod. Of course, it'll be almost probably just a month from now. I always think the goldenrod peaks around September 15th. So it's just starting, whereas the Queen Anne's Lace uh, is just ending. It's got a few flowers still, some are still quite domed, some are flattening, and some are starting to curl upward uh, where they produce these great seed heads of, uh, for Queen Anne's Lace. And each one of those little white flowers will eventually turn into a seed right here. So they, they uh, curl up, they sort of protect themselves until the seeds ripen and then eventually these will all be dispersed by uh, wind. And of course, not all of these are gonna become another Queen Anne lace flower. Lots of these will become food for something like a mouse or a meadowvole or a bird. 
All right, we're going to continue on along the cliff trail and we're going to bear right. This, there's a path that goes off this way. And there's a path that goes off this way. They parallel each other and then branch off. Forget those. We're going to stay right, stay along the cliff plant path. And we'll come to this little pond, uh, teardrop pond. Um, again, extremely low. I've never seen it this low. Uh, of course, I'm not usually walking out here in the, in the summertime. I, I save my clay head walks for the fall and winter, but it's all rimmed. This is a stone wall all the way around this particular pond. It was probably uh, used to collect peat, as were, was another pond. It's very close to the edge of the bluff. Uh, so what they would sometimes do is, is wall them up and then they would have a break in the wall, let it drain out and then cut peat from the center. But again, more lily pads, beautiful little pond. Very hard to see these right now, uh, but this one, most of them have at least one little entry point where you can peek in and see what's going on. Um, so this is Teardrop Pond, very small. Again, most of the ponds, well, most of the ponds on Black Island and Clayhead are um, kettle hole ponds. They're left over from glacial, um, from big giant chunk of a glacier that uh, melted more slowly and left a depression in the landscape but also left very fine material in the bottom clay so that they uh, would hold water for quite a long time. So they're, they're actually perched water bodies. In other words, they're perched above the water table. On we go to another pond. Uh, this is Little Sockum. Um, so you may be familiar with a sort of a two-part pond right near the edge of the um, bluffs one of which eroded over the edge. The erosion finally broke into the pond and drained it out. And that is this pond, Little Sockum. Um, and it used to be quite a large pond, but most of the water is gone and it seeps out, but there's still, it's slowly been getting a little bit more. It's got some, I'll show you in a, another view in a second where the water for this comes from. Uh, but around this mostly is, there's some cattails, which is native grass, and there's some um, switchgrass, panic grass, which I've been talking about a lot this summer, just starting to grow out its seed heads. Uh, a week or two weeks ago, there would be no seed, he seed heads yet. It would all just be grasses. Both those and the cattails are, are native grasses that are great for um, for, uh, holding holding the land and feeding animals, and if but there's plenty of this as well, which is Phragmites, uh, very tall reed grass, um, and it's but its seed head is also just ripening this time of year, and they are beautiful. I don't know what color that is, but I think it is one of the most beautiful colors I see in nature on Black Island every year. I am. I'm just astounded again at how beautiful, uh, sort of purpley brown, I don't know, I don't have the words to describe it, but just how beautiful the seed head of the Phragmites is. Um, oh, there we go. And we're just, <clears throat> since we're so close to the bluff, we, I figured we would take our one gratuitous view of, uh, of scenic Block Island, the kind of uh, views that you would normally see if you went on your, on, uh, on a like a clayhead walk or a Mohegan Bluffs walk. Um, and this is uh, clayhead, um, the bluff system. And this is where it's sort of gullied out. And you can see there's uh, a lot of green in here. And if you, th if you follow this back, the edge of the bluff was, is here and the pond is here. It's right there. Uh, and you can't walk between the two anymore. But this is where the, it finally eroded and the water in the pond just eroded this great gully down. When I, I mean, I can remember, it wasn't that long ago, I think it's 10 years probably that this pond uh, got eroded over the edge, but the edge of the bluff used to be a little bit more like this, right? So all this is gone. And the path actually that we just took uh, used to come around this edge, but the path went along with the land and the water. So had to move the path inland. 
Anyway, this is a wonderful, typical picture of uh, clayhead bluffs. Here's a little another one, looking a little bit close, more closely at the, what makes up the bluff, why it's so um, uh, subject to erosion. It's really just a lot of very fine material, clay. They don't call it clayhead for nothing. A lot of clay, a lot of stone, a lot of sand, and not only, uh, most of the erosion is from uh, water running over it, or from wind-driven uh, rain. It's like a sand blasting the, sur uh, the face of the bluff. So this breaks off quite a bit. And as you, um, but when you're at this spot, looking down, it's probably one of the few times you get to look down uh, on a herring gull. Usually the herring gulls are above you. In this particular day, I was above it. So always something to see when you look down. <clears throat> So <clears throat> now we've retreated back from the little spur that we took up to the bluff. And there's a little uh, boardwalk. I'm probably standing. I am standing on it. So to the, if I'm looking this way, which would be to the south, to my left, it, east, is the pond I just spoke of, which is um, Little Sockham. And then to the right, or west is this pond, which again has very little water in it. And it's really, this is really more of a, a marsh swamp. Even in the best of times, uh, it has a lot of vegetation in it, but it has, it will have standing water. And whether or not this is part of Little Sockham, I've heard it named Hourglass because it used to have this pinch point, uh, but this water will flow into, um, into Little Sockham. So uh, I don't think we really need to know the name. We just need to know how beautiful it is and how they interact with each other. Um, at its edge, we have some typical um, sort of moist, um, moist or wetland vegetation, such as this on our right. And this is the seed head for the button bush. And a couple of weeks ago, I showed you a picture of button bush in uh, full bloom. And here it is, the little blossoms have each have gone. They're mostly either disappeared or browned and about disappear. And what's left is this little head. And each one of these would have the seeds from each one of these flowers. Um, this is a fairly new plant. I had not noticed, um, button bush in here before and it's just uh, one plant right along the edge so those seeds have dispersed and uh, it's a perfect place for it so that'll be good um, and if you look down you start to see some really small plants right at the boardwalk again I, I left a bit of the boardwalk in this photo so you could get a sense of the size this is a tiny little plant it's called Canada St. John's wort and uh, this I, I did pull this one up uh, there's a lot of this. This is Marsh St. John's wort. Um, and if you wanted to see what the Canada looked like bigger and in bloom, this one is just starting to bloom. Just this one blossom. These with their little red buds are actually going to be a bright yellow flower. It's just one of the, it's part of the magic of nature, but it's a beautiful little plant once you look at it more closely and I think only to be outdone by the marsh St. John's wort which again they both tend to have like these little clusters of buds and then uh, a tiny tiny beautiful pink flower um, with these you know these um, these are the uh, these are the pistols I believe yes pistols um, and just, it's just, I don't think an artist or a sculptor could make this up. It's just such a great uh, plant, but very hard to photograph because it's tiny. And so I didn't quite get the image I wanted. This was the most clear one I got. Plus this particular day, it was blowing about 22 miles an hour. So I couldn't, everything was shaking, <laughs> but I was happy. So uh, just sort of, remind you where we are we've come this way we um we uh, i lost track of where i am here we go yes we've left the blue trail and went this way to 
stump pond and then we went down and we went to teardrop pond and then this is little sockum and the bluff edge that we just saw and then this is the back swamp associated with little swamp little sockum um, now the rest of this walk which we're going to see some great things as well but it's a little bit more complicated if you happen to be walking so here's the rule just keep taking a right most of the time and i'll point out the two times where you don't take the first right. So in order to take the path that I'm about to show you from this point, you come back, you leave the little boardwalk and you take a right and you just keep taking rights. And eventually you will, there's lots of other paths here. Just keep taking the right, take the right, take the right up here. You'll take a right now and you'll put you in this big field. Um, and then you'll just walk along the, edge but if you went around to the right edge you would end up to the same place and you come down here and then you take a right and if at some point you realize i'm saying right and i'm going left just d-wave at me <laughs> i'm not good with my left and right sometimes so here's the exception don't when you don't take your first right your first right after going this way is here and it's a dead end and it's an okay walk, but it's a dead end. So it wouldn't hurt you if you took it. Take your second right. And that will lead you up along this edge of the pond. All right, so that was just a little interlude. And after you take that second right and you start going up that path, which I was happy to see um, the mower of clay head, I don't think knows it's there because it was a little rough. It was like the difference between a rough golf course and a perfectly manuc manicured greens golf course and i prefer the rough golf course so i love this path because it was mowed enough to get by it and wasn't high grass or anything like that but it looked a little bit just more inviting and but there's it's it is uh like most of the clay paths you know it's high vegetation on both sides of you I start, detected this plant before by scent before I saw it. The air had this wonderful, like light, sweet scent of sweet pepper bush. And I thought, oh, it must be here. And then I looked and saw that there's like a whole, it was almost a hedgerow. And on the other side of this is, is a, uh, uh, a dry swamp right now. Uh, but you can't get through it. It's quite, um, it's it's quite densely packed in. Uh, I kind of kept trying to peek in and see what was in there. I'd love to go in there and see what kind of plants are in there, but uh, I didn't do it on this particular day. I just uh, admired the uh, sweet pepper bush, and here is a closer up of that. And eventually you'll come to another pond, which I don't know the name of. Um, this pond, the Clayhead Trail, um, Clayhead Land is on this side of the pond and on the other side of the pond is private property. So the, I believe the boundary is somewhere in between. But it is a typical uh, pond on Block Island right now. It's, here's some sweet pepper bush sticking up. And the, but most of it is surrounded by um, water willow. And here it is, a, sort of this long strand, just sort of bends over, it's bending over, it's, it's over here. There are water lilies out here as well, and some cattails. Um, and here's an up close version of the flower of the water lily. Of course, it's not the flower, there are many flowers. This one's still in bloom, this one's already lost its petals. Um, these are pretty much past, or they're going um, in this particular pond. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, this is a great birding pond. I've been here many times it's because it's a little bit be bigger and a little bit deeper. And you can tell that because it still has water in it <laughs> this time of year. Um, so you often get some good waterfowl in here and um, there's a nice density around for um, small songbirds trying to uh, have protection, eat the seeds of the sweet pepper bush and I uh, get a little water. Uh, one thing you can, uh, here's a rule of thumb. Anytime you see uh, lily pads on a pond, 
uh, you can know that that part of the pond is no deeper than about four feet, uh, which is a lot of water <laughs> this time of year. But um, lily pads or water lilies will not uh, grow longer, uh, deeper than, than four feet. They just don't have the structure in the stem system because they are actually attached to the bottom of the pond and um, they have to be able to support themselves. And at five feet, they just can't support that height. So anytime you're wondering how deep a pond is, if it's got uh, water lily pads on it, it's that spot at least is no more than four feet deep. All right, we're gonna turn around and continue on taking rights, taking rights, and you'll get to this spot. Uh, this is this lot is called Tower Hill, and it is maintained in a mowed um, grassland. This is where there used to be uh, World War II spotting towers, uh, big concrete uh, towers of, of which there are a few around the island that have been incorporated into house houses. But the two that were here were destroyed in 1975. And they were, uh, they were quite dilapidated, um, falling apart, and they were quite an attractive nu nuisance in the 70s. So the Lapham families actually, family actually had them uh, taken down um, because of their safety hazard. And new this year, the path is going right through the top of the, uh, the hill. Usually the path goes around the edge, but for whatever reason this year, the path is going through the middle. Um, and right about here, if you look off, you can see a couple of chunks of uh, concrete and some holes, little holes. Um, they're pretty much filled in like the size of your fist, you know, like a big rock. And that's where the uh, foundations of the towers were actually. Uh, again, grassland, flowers, summer flowers, meadow flowers, some Queen Anne's lace, and chicory, lots of um, um, dandelions. But this is the biggest patch of rabbit's foot clover I have ever seen <laughs> on Black Island. You find rabbit's cl foot clover, and it's well named. Each little flower is so soft and fuzzy and looks just like a rabbit's foot. But this patch is like huge. It's so inviting too. If I was a little kid, I don't wanna just lie right down on it. Um, but I'm not a little kid and I'm worried about bees, so I stayed upright. All right, so this is gonna go, this is a, a hilltop. Again, sometimes, much of this walk I think would be better in the winter and spring because the vegetation is off and you do get some better views at the top of these big hills. Uh, when there's no vegetation. And of course the view into the ponds is much better when there's no vegetation. But we're gonna be going down uh, over the crest and then down the hill. When you get to the bottom of the hill, there, you're intersecting a, a path, take a right. And um, that will take you to another intersection and there you take a left. So I try to take pictures of all these intersections and guess what, they all look the same. While I was up on this hill, I saw two butterflies, or two types of butterflies. I saw several monarchs, uh, which is on our right. Uh, this is a male monarch, and you can tell because this vein right here has this little oval distension. So those are the males, and they produce, those little distensions produce a pheromone that help uh, attract the females. And the female, this veining uh, does not have this little pocket, pheromone pocket, they call it. And all the veins are just a little bit wider. Um, none of these, these two pictures of butterfly, that's my picture. This is from the internet. The uh, butterfly planes. <laughs> uh, it's pretty hard to get a butterfly photograph, uh, but I did see a, a black swallow wart dashing around and it was on milkweed. So I went to the internet and lo and behold, there was a picture of it on a milkweed, which was very convenient. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful butterfly. And uh, they must be just emerging because it looked pristine. And this one was actually taken a uh, previous year um, but it had also just emerged and was really pristine. So this is the time for butterflies and notice those antennae.
<clears throat> wands, no hairs, just a long filament and a little knob on the end, both of them. So, all right. So if you had gone down the hill and taken a right and then taking your next left, it would take you down this path uh, to one of the great, there are so many wonderful swamp maples throughout uh, Clayhead. Um, and this will go down the hill. And this tree right here that I'm pointing at, that is our rotary tree. That's right. So we are going to, we came up, before from the big pine came up this way and then we went that way and now we've looped down and we're coming to our rotary tree so we're nearing the end uh, if you'd taken a right when you got to the rotary tree you would head down towards the big pine and here's another picture of the big pine from a different angle the other side um, and sort of like the moon the other side of the big pine looks the same as the first side of the big pine um, and the main path that we took uh, we've now rejoined the blue trail you would just go right around the big path and retrace your steps this particular day i went this way straight it's a little shortcut out to the road the lapham road so that i could see or I attempt to see into the two ponds that are along the road there which were could not see into them because again, the vegetation was too high for me. I think in that case, a decent six foot person probably would have been able to see into that pond, but I'll have to wait for winter. But along the way, we found us another sedge. Last week we had a sedge. This is a different type. Notice if you were to compare it to last week's version uh, uh, walk, you would notice that it had uh, sort of one one stem with a few of said seed heads this is like ev all sprouting out all over and it has a very flat like stem so this is flat stitch sedge which is along the wetland that i uh could not see through too anyway that we've kind of done our loop and explored that end of of clayhead east and the ponds um, there are lots of other things going on around Block Island in the way of natural history. Of course, I couldn't leave you without this week's picture of blackberries. Uh, almost enough for a pie in this particular picture. Um, they are not pre-sugared, they're dusty. And uh, that's one of the hazards of picking. Some of the best blackberry picking is along dirt roads. So you have to, um, you have to just don't worry about it pick them, they're delicious, rinse them off, no problem. They'll go in a pie just perfectly. Um, and you always wanna have a couple that aren't quite ripe because that will counteract the intense sweetness of the sugar that you have to add to this pie. <laughs> this is always too much for uh, my taste, whoops. Um, and of course this week we also had in hand a garter snake, not this particular garter snake, <clears throat> this is a photo from uh, 2016, but uh, a garter, garter snake nonetheless, and uh, beautiful. And they're just such a wonderful animal. They look, and they actually are quite soft, and their scales are just so manipulative. You just can, they can just curl around anything. And uh, their belly is smoother, and you can see, just see the edge of the belly here. And I probably should have warned people that there was going to be a snake picture in case there's anybody who doesn't like them. But uh, there you go, a non-poisonous uh, garter snake uh, as seen on Block Island at some point. Another thing you're starting to see around most of the smaller freshwater ponds on Block Island, if you look carefully and once you look, you start to see them everywhere, are the swamp rose mallows. Uh, they're in the hibiscus family, which you can tell pretty clearly by the shape of the flower. There are not very many places that have all three colors, pink, white, and red, or magenta. Um, this is a wonderful swamp that has also has no water in it right now, uh, but it is completely ringed with mallows, rose swamp mallows. They have a lot of variety in um, color, as you can see. And um, I try to get a few of them. Of course, this is the white with the red center. 
and then there's pink and pink with white centers and pink with red centers and there's magenta and uh, some of the magenta have really or red have really dark red centers others not so much but the rose mallows if you go by the pond on Corneck Road in front of Gasner's um, look at the back edge there's rose mallows there there are rose mallows and they this is a, a, a plant that can take a little bit of brackish water um, there are rose mallows just between uh, in the swamp between the Orr and the Ball O'Brien Park um, and you just start noticing in the ditches that have a little, they do like wet feet, even if it's not standing water, their feet need to be moist, their roots that is. Um, so anywhere around the edge, they'll be right at the edge uh, and keep your eye out all of a sudden through between now and the first week of September, you are start to see uh, the swamp rose mallows around the island. Uh, another plant around that's just coming out is a uh, bone set. Uh, I actually love this plant because you don't see it much anymore. So when I find it, I take a picture. Uh, it's uh, one of the distinctive characteristics of the bone set is the way the plant grows between out of the leaves here. I can go, you can see the leaves are all jointed, right? Or not, they're, they're uh, not jointed, they're, connected and the stem grows right up through it um, and um, so I think that has something to do with the name bone set that means it can heal its break its break <laughs> um, I heard that a long time ago I never knew if it was true now I'm gonna have to look it up so don't take don't take that for ver verbatim <laughs> uh, beautiful each one of these again is individual flower head and I think we maybe, oops, there we go, bone set. And the bird list uh, for the walk that I did on uh, August 1st at Clayhead. Uh, again, it's a mini bird list. I probably missed something because I do it from memory, but it was the first one I've done of these that had the osprey flying overhead that with a fish that it must have picked up down below in Clayhead. And again, this is an internet image. I am not that much of an artist. And with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen so I can take questions. And maybe we can unmute everybody. Let's see, unmute all. I think I just did it. Yay. <laughs> Thank you everybody for sticking with me. That might have been a little bit longer than usual and uh, don't be afeard go out there and try out the clayhead trails um, and you can always get this on your since it'll be recorded on our website you can put it on your phone and you go now where where do i turn right where do i turn left <laughs> just stay right anybody see anything interesting in this presentation it's fun to know where the lookout tower was because oh, i can okay. remember yeah. seeing it when I was started to come out in 1970 and okay. wandered up there and then all of a sudden it wasn't there anymore. That's right. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell a terrible story on myself. Uh, I know it was 1975 because that was the year I graduated from high school and uh, the brand new teacher on Black Island took us up there the a couple of days before it was, uh, they were actually blown up uh, because some of us hadn't seen it. I had never been to Clayhead uh, until that point. That was the first time I'd ever been to Clayhead, the couple of days before they blew up the towers. <laughs> and now it's like my second home, uh, that area. But um, so, yeah, disgraceful grow up on Black Island, never been to Clayhead, which of course many people know as the maze. I, I do call it uh, Clayhead out of deference to the family who thinks that a maze is a scary place and they don't think of it as a scary place. <laughs> so, so we call it clayhead trails. Um, I should have tipped you all off. The last three of these have had an orb hidden in a couple of the photos. <laughs> the last three of the presentations. So if, if you go back, you, you might find them. <laughs> 
I think I spotted it as when you said it and uh but I I couldn't tell exactly. So yeah. that was pretty funny though. <laughs> it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for the fun I of it. I also love learning yeah. I also love learning about the the colloquial names of the ponds because I never know the names. I know there's you know, the, what is there, three hundred and sixty about yeah. <laughs> on the island, different uh ponds and to know some of the names is is definitely yeah. helpful and and fun to learn so yeah there's quite a few i don't know the name of and i i'm always asking people old timers quote unquote what's the name of that and uh, there's a couple that uh i've never gotten an answer to um and i'm, I'm just getting to the point where there's not gonna be enough old timers left to tell me what the you name to map them out <laughs> yeah i got the ones in my head but the ones i never learned i don't have <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are great. One of my favorite is Be Betty Pucky Pond. <laughs> That's over by Champlin Road. <laughs> anyway, uh, if there are any questions or comments, otherwise, people are always welcome to email me if questions come up afterwards at kim.gaffet at tnc.org. And uh, I guess. With that, I'll say have a good day. The weather finally got cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Kim. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to end. Thank you, now. Kim. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. See you soon, I hope. Hope so. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.